Welcome back. This is Lecture 2, Basic Music Vocabulary and Instrument Types. So what we're going to do in this course is use a musicological approach. Now the difference between that approach and just a casual approach is this. There's two types of listening, active and passive listening. Passive listening is where you listen to something just for pleasure and enjoyment. It might even be background music that you're not even thinking about. But active listening means we're going to be listening for certain things in the pieces of music we have. And the musicological approach comes from this study of music as an academic subject. And that's distinct from training for music to play in a band or to write music. And it's more about scholarly research. So we're going to approach our entire course from a musicological perspective. So we're going to look at how music works and occurs in a culture. So how it's produced, how it's received, how it's transmitted, how it's stored, and how it's reproduced. So that means that we're going to need a vocabulary. We're going to need a vocabulary and some understanding of different musical instrument types so we can have a common starting place. So the vocabulary of music will provide for us the following precise descriptions of phenomena as we hear them, a language to make comparisons, and a similar frame of reference. And what that means is a similar way of looking at something. So we can all kind of agree to look at things in a similar way. So what these precise descriptions are of phenomena would be something like this. If I heard something that went like this, well, what I would be describing that as, as a series of chords, and maybe the melody on Three Blind Mice. And so what I want to do as a musicologist is be precise in my language. So that's what you're going to do. In this course, you're going to learn to be very precise in how you describe the music we're listening to and studying. So here are some basic musical terms. Now, I know we're not going to go into great length, there are hundreds of musical terms that one could use, especially in performance and in composition and, of course, in musicology. But we're going to limit ourselves to some basics that are just very practical for us. And then they fit the scope of this course. So the first one is melody. So a melody is nothing more than a series of musical notes or tones arranged in a definite pattern of pitch and rhythm. Pitch means high or low. Rhythm, of course, means how they're sequenced, how they happen one after another. So a melody might sound like this. And we hear that as a single line that's rising and falling. And you might recognize that as alueta. Or maybe you don't know that, that tune, but you can still recognize it as a melody. So if we were describing that, we would call that a melody. And we tend to think of it as the horizontal aspect of music. And this is really from a graphic perspective, the way music is written down. So it, in a graphical perspective, it would look like it's starting at this end and moving. That's the whole idea, that horizontal idea. And then a scale is nothing but an organized pattern of music that's very specific. So for instance, if I had a major scale, it would sound like this. If I had a minor scale, it would sound like that. So there are differences in the way the tones are arranged in order. Harmony means the simultaneous occurring frequencies, pitches, or chords. So a melody, has that. Chords have that kind of sound. And so they are more than one note, usually three at least, played at the same time. So if you're a guitarist, that's what you're doing. You can play a melody, of course, sing, single line melody, but you can play chords as well by stopping strings and using a pick to pluck those strings. 
pianos do the same idea, and many, many instruments together can play simultaneously and create chords. So we think of this from a graphic perspective, like we'd see it on a staff, as the vertical aspect of music. Then we have something that's very important, and it's called timbre. It looks like timbre on the, on the spelling, but we pronounce it timbre. And this means the tone color or tone quality that's perceived with a sound or a note. And it distinguishes the different types of sound production, such as choir voices or strings, wind instruments or percussion instruments. So if I played this, but then sang it, la, you can tell the difference between the piano sound and my voice because of the tone quality. That's the result of how all the frequencies of sound mix together and which ones predominate. The ones that predominate that we hear produce the different qualities of sound that we call timbre. And then rhythm, and rhythm is foundational to all music. And really we have, we wanna divide it into three simple areas of understanding. The first is a beat. So I have on my phone something called a metronome. And the metronome is nothing more than a time namer. So I'm going to set this at, uh, let's set it at 100. So as you can see, what I'm doing is I have this set at 100. That means 100 clicks per minute. So it would sound like this. And so what we have here are beats. And beats are just pulses that are accented so we can hear them. Well, meter is something slightly different. It's how we would measure those beats in groups. So I could count this if I'm listening to music. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Or one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So don't confuse beat with meter. Meter is a way of measuring groups of beats. And then tempo is simply the relative speed of a pulse. So that's at 100. Well, what if I do this? That's 199. That's 199 beats per minute. So what we're going to be talking about when we listen to different music from around the world are the beats, the meter, and the tempo. Is it fast? Is it slow? What makes it have that particular rhythm? And then form is nothing more than how music ideas are grouped into larger structures. So it might be a song, it might be a symphony, it might be a concerto, and we will spend a little bit of time talking about form. We're not gonna go into great detail about it, but it's important to know that so that we could say, well, that particular um, piece of music was like a hymn that you might sing in mass. Or this is a song that you might sing in, um, in a celebration. So we want to look at form because that's how people take all these elements and put them together to make larger structures. So let's now look at the classifications of musical instruments. And this goes back to right around 1914 by uh, two gentlemen called Hornbostel and Sachs. And Eric Moritz von Hornbostel and Kurt Sachs created an instrument classification system in 1914. The Germans were the pioneers in musicology. And in the first part of the uh, 20th century, they began to do what's called musicological research and they wanted to classify things. They wanted to be able to, as they were listening to music and cataloging it and analyzing it around the world, come up with similar classifications for instruments. And they came up with four. Now we have five because uh, musical instruments have changed dramatically in over 100 years. And so let's look at these. But before we do, we have to look at this suffix. Now the suffix is the end of a word, of course. And the suffix we're going to be using is phone, P-H-O-N-E. Now you have your cell phone and a telephone. 
and a microphone. So we're, it has a Greek origin. The word is phony in Greek, and it really means originally sound or voice. So we'll use that suffix as a descriptor for things like aerophone and membranophone. So when you see that suffix at the end of the word, it simply means the sound or the voice. So let's start with aerophones. And aerophones are instruments that produce sound primarily by causing a body of air to vibrate. And they would sound something like this. Voices. There's an oboe. And there's a French horn. So all of the instruments that use an air column to make it vibrate are called aerophones. And that's an older spelling for aerophones. It's an old British spelling, but we've retained that today. So an aerophone simply means air to vibrate. That's kind of easy to remember. Now the voice is now considered, it is debated somewhat, uh, as a type of aerophone. And even though it's not an instrument separate from our bodies, um, the epiglottis and the vocal nodules and the vocal folds uh, vibrate in a similar fashion to what happens with my lips if I'm playing a trumpet. And so we consider the voice a type of aerophone, but we'll always classify things that we hear that are voice generated as vocal music, even though technically you could call it an aerophone. Then we have chordophones. Now chordophones make a sound by way of a vibra vibrating string, a chord. So like a vibrating string stretched between two points. Now it usually has to be stretched between two points to get it to be uh, taut enough to be able to vibrate and make sound. So here are some examples of chordophones. Violin. Guitar. Piano. Sitar from India. So all of these, including one of the oldest, which is a picture right here, you can see where my cursor is, that's called a monochord. And the monochord was used by Greek philosophers and scientists way, way back um, to analyze the structure of sound. And they came up with some, some remarkable things. And we'll do some of that in class. Idiophones um, use the material that are struck, shaken, or scraped like a bell or a gong and a rattle, and it sounds like the material it's made out of. So it creates the sound primarily by the vibration of the instrument itself without the use of an extra air column, strings, or membranes. We call them idiophones because the, the prefix idio means self. So it's kind of like, you know, the id means self. So they sound like them, like they look and like the material they're made out of. Here's an example. Bells. Xylophone. Chimes. Marimba. And those were all idiophones, cymbals and clicking blocks. All of those instruments are called idiophones. Then we have membranophones. And a membrane is merely simply a piece of cloth or leather or other synthetic material that's stretched over a, a body. So for instance, a tube. So we have pictures of timpani and conga drums and a snare drum, some djembes and some tabla drums, and then a rattle. And so all of these that have a skin or a membrane stretched over the top, we call membranophones. And they sound variously like this. Snare drum, that was timpani before. And so we see these all around us in drum sets, in um, children's toys. You see idiophones and membranophones a lot. 
But then the new classification that got added to the original four is electrophones. Now that's the initial sound is either produced by an electronic means or is conventionally produced uh, as by a vibrating string and electronically amplified. So an electric guitar, um, you can call it uh, a chordophone because it is indeed that, but it's also an electrophone in the sense that you, the use of the pickup at the lower end of the, the, the fingerboard down here below where the strings are attached, that has pickups that amplify the sound electronically. And then synthesizers, um, sounds made from computers like the ones you're hearing today um, on my synthesizer here on my main, on my main computer, they are all electrophones and they can sound like this. Here's some synthesizer sounds. So we've listened to that same melody through all the different types of classifications of instruments. And then we have some, like I mentioned before, uh, that are mixed types. So you can use one, more than one uh, sound producing system, like an electric guitar, which is both a chordophone and an electronophone. A drum set has idiophones and membranophones. Like if it uses cowbells or cymbals, those are idiophones. And then the drums themselves are membranophones. And the bottom of the snare drum has little wires that bounce against the bottom head. And those are idiophones as well. So many of the instruments we use have all of those. Well, if you will, just check Canvas for your assignment, and I'll see you in class. Thank you. <laughs>